seashores and wooden lands of the north, it's a story of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around, my friend, and all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, come on in. How do you like this spring weather so far? It's been goofy. Last week, we brought you what we thought would be the last rabbit hunt of the season. But when it thawed, John Ford and I decided to try it ourselves. No dog, just the two of us for an afternoon stroll. We put a couple more rabbits in the freezer. It's an interesting story. Another interesting spring activity that's coming up is brown trout fishing along the Great Lakes shoreline. Captain Emil Dean is using his river boat so he can get in close to shore where the brown trout are feeding. We have a pheasant paprikash recipe and a lot more, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. March usually isn't the most productive month to hunt rabbits because there aren't nearly as many cottontails in the woods and fields as there were earlier in the winter. Predators hunt for bunnies every day while the bunnies are hunting for their own food. You can sometimes see where they've been eating. Oh man, you want to see some rabbit damage. Look at this. Look at this. They've got down here and stripped off this bark. This is what they like to eat. Get this uh, cambium layer, I guess, right underneath the bark. Nutrition in there. But those rabbits, they just clean this off. Another one right down there. Well, you can see several areas. Boy, those are hungry rabbits. <laughs> Boy, they ought to be around here. We didn't find any cottontails in the woods. They seem to be out in the open field, sitting in the grass. You'll often find this is the case on a warm winter day. Oh. Got him. Yeah, I got him. That Wait. was the darndest thing. John, we were just talking about where the bunnies were, <laughs> and you just about stepped on that one. Yeah, here it is right here. Oh. That's it. That's all it took. Well, I'll be darned, it was sitting right out in the open field right here. Son of a gun. A good shot. Well, I almost thought I saw another one run down there. Yeah, this will be tasty. I just got those other ones from Freddy, all cut up and soaked in vinegar and salt water. They're nice and white, ready to go. Now, well, here we are. Now I'm using a different gun this time. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm using this double barrel. It's a little heavier than the other one, but I want the bigger shell. I want more pellets out there, which you just saw it makes a difference. I also have another little gimmick that I, that we just got. I have an Outdoors Club emblem on them right here. This is called, and I'm not kidding, it's called a butt buddy for your gun butt. Put the butt of the gun in there. Helps you carry it as you're, as you're walking. It keeps the muzzle up and uh, it's real easy to carry a heavy, heavier gun. So, John, now that we have some success here, this is a great day for rabbit hunting. It's uh, oh, in the 40s, snow is melting. This is gonna be just about the end of it this season. I mean, there's only really 10 days left in March, so. Nothing like a little success in the field to perk you up. Now my leg, which I couldn't even walk on in deer season, carries me okay nowadays. Well, it still hurts a little, and I have to watch where I step and how I step but it's good to be able to get around again. Now I'm hunting the edge of a woods and the next rabbit is in the grass along the field. Get him? Nope. Behind him on both shots. But it was exhilarating. Boy, that thing took off. Really took off. Angled up around there. Well, you can see where I, uh, you can see my pattern here actually. That one jumped out quite a bit ahead. Caught the edge of the tree, because it was running right over there. That cottontail took off and kept going, but I'm sure that some ducked into holes before I saw them. Now here's the kind of thing where, where rabbits can hide in, 
right down here. This is a, this hole, some people might think it's woodchuck, but I don't think it's woodchuck because of all the dirt that's been removed, this is something that has been really digging. And I would say possibly a badger. I know you've seen badgers back here, John. Oh yeah, right? I have, yeah. yeah. So that could easily be a badger, uh, in which case it would be a bad move for a rabbit to try to run down that hole. <laughs> I, and I don't know what the deal is here, if they've been chewing it or what, but it's all torn up around there. Nosing around the woods is an interesting part of hunting, looking for clues that tell you where the game has been. This was a bunny that I just scared up about 50 yards back there. These are its front feet. Front feet go down, and then between its legs, between its hind legs, its hind legs come around and land right there. And then it leaped way up ahead there. Really care, it's about, it has about eight feet between strides, so it was running right along there. A clean escape for now, but you know, he, he could run into a fox in the next half hour. So he isn't all that lucky. People don't realize that foxes and hawks hunt all day, every day. They eat any rabbit they can catch, and later this spring, they'll eat a lot of baby bunnies. Human hunters stop hunting long before the baby game animals are born, and the season doesn't open again until fall. Oh, look here, John. Here's where we had a rabbit, and it doesn't look, doesn't look all that old either. Something got a rabbit and tore it apart. Could be a hawk or a fox, would be my guess. That's fairly fresh. When predators catch rabbits, they eat them on the spot, and they might start their meal before the rabbit is even dead. That's why we hunters feel our style of taking game is, well, in many ways, much more humane than Mother Nature's. There you go. Get him. Got him. Good shot. One shot. Oh. Whoa. Got to admit, that surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have my gun quite shouldered enough. But that was amazing. Whoa. We humans don't squeeze rabbits to death or kill them by pulling them apart the way predators often do. We use shotguns to dispatch our game cleanly. Rabbits are usually taken at very close range, and the time you have to shoot might only be a couple of seconds. If your pattern hits the rabbit, it only takes a couple of shotgun pellets, sometimes just one, and the rabbit is dead within seconds. That's what we try to do every time we shoot. We're done, John. <laughs> there we go. All Number right. two cottontail in 25 minutes, maybe. Yeah, this is great. In the game bag, and off we go. Well, there's the car. We've been working back to the car here for about most of the 25 minutes, saying we're going to pack it up. Well, that was the easiest rabbit hunt of the season and the last for us. Well, at least until next year when the snow falls. A rabbit season closes at the end of March, so if you're thinking of doing any rabbit hunting at all, this weekend is it. Let's turn our attention to fishing. Here's the trophy crappie that we have on display here at our museum. This is much bigger than the average crappie. What was it caught on? I'd say a minnow. Why would I say that? Well, in the current issue of the Outdoor Digest, I ran a computer analysis of the baits used to catch trophy crappie since 1984. Minnows accounted for 228, compared to only 27 on worms or night crawlers. 23 on spinners, and 21 on wax worms. You can see 76% were caught on minnows, far and away the favored bait for crappies. So the type of bait you choose makes a world of difference as to what type of fish you're gonna catch. Let's take a look at some of the trophies that were caught in late winter and early spring in our trophy book. Featured in the digest was this great picture of Jeff Stoll from Chessening with his trophy crappie, a 15 and a half incher, one and three quarter pounds, caught it on a minnow, apparently on a tip up. He was fishing Gladwin County's Wixom Lake. Here's a two pound, five ounce black crappie, 16 inches long that Pat Marino from Traverse City caught on a local lake, Chandler Lake, also fishing with a minnow in early March. Shaped like a panfish, but not a crappie, 
the brownish coloration is one tip that it's a rock bass. This one was a foot long. Paul McTeer from Williamsburg caught it from Skagamog Lake in Grand Traverse County, fishing a teardrop and wax worm. Now here's one of the species that is running in the streams right now. It's a white sucker, a huge one, over 22 inches long, slightly over five pounds. Doris Taylor from Grant caught it fishing a red worm in the Muskegon River at the end of March. Genevieve Santer from Holly was using a big sucker minnow under a tip-up, undoubtedly for pike, but from her secret lake in Oakland County, she pulled up this 29-inch channel catfish. Her pocket delire showed it weighed about 14 pounds. Not very many people get trophy burbot mounted, but Joe Harmon from Auburn Hills did a 25-incher taken from Benzie County's Crystal Lake. He caught it on a Swedish pimple, and yes, Joe has a very entertaining story that goes with this trophy. I was uh, fishing in northern Michigan, and it was my first major ice fishing trip up north, and I was fishing with my girlfriend's brother-in-law, who's an outstanding fisherman. Unfortunately, she's my ex-girlfriend now, and I left all my great warm fishing and hunting clothes down here because I assumed they would be intelligent enough to have a nice house. They didn't, so I froze to death. Oh, so you were fishing out on the open right. ice? Okay. Right, that's right. So after tearing into a human popsicle, I landed this thing. We were fishing 150 feet of water, and when he hit, I was thinking lake trout, northern pike, and I pulled him up, and I said, well, what in the world is this? And my girlfriend's brother-in-law said, well, it's a burbot. I said, well, what's that? It's a fish. And then the next day we went fishing on Glen Lake and he caught a master angler lake trout. And the day after that, he caught another master angler lake trout. But when he was getting it up out of the hole, fish through the hook and he lost it. Hmm. And Jim Irvin from Pontiac, Michigan did the taxidermy work, so I'd like to thank him for that. Oh, well, it's a terrific mount. I'm glad you, you brought this down to show people what a burbot looks like, and I'm sorry to hear about the deal with your girlfriend. Maybe, maybe it'll get back well, together. Hopefully this will work. Oh, that's a great story, and Joe's a great sportsman for getting this trophy burbot mounted. That's why Joe Harmon from Auburn Hills is our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. By the way, Joe Harmon is going to loan us that mount of the trophy burbot to put in our fish collection here at the museum. He's going to bring that down to us in about two weeks. Where else in the world could you see a good mount of a trophy burbot like that? Where else could you see a diorama like this? These are three stillborn fawns. The story behind them is the mother was hit by a car up in Houghton Lake. In 1951, the DNR gave these three fawns to taxidermist Franklin Saltz, who had to go through some special processes on pickling the hides because oh, they were so thin and so delicate. But he did an exquisite job of mounting this diorama. These stillborn fawns essentially gives you the idea of what newborn fawns look like. A tremendous job by Franklin Saltz. These mounts have lasted 40 years. He has some other great mounts on display here at the museum. Now this Saturday from 10 to 5, taxidermist Tim Hayes will be working at the Michigan Outdoors TV Museum and Bath. His project this Saturday will be mounting ducks, so you can come and see how waterfowl mounts are created. Now that's on Saturday, but on Sunday, Larry and Cindy Mouski will be our special guests. They're primarily known for their involvement in duck hunting, but on Sunday, they'll be talking about deer antlers. They'll have this video of the two bucks fighting. They taped this during their studies of white-tailed deer. Larry and Cindy have a vast collection of shed antlers. They love to talk to people about how to find shed antlers at this time of year in the woods. Of course, we have Jose on display with his 15 sets of shed antlers that he grew during his life. Emil Dean has been a charter captain since captain's licenses were first issued in the late 1960s. Fall, winter, and spring, he guides anglers to steelhead on the Manistee River. All right! Yeah. <laughs> Emil's always been concerned that legislators and some DNR managers don't understand our recreational fishery, which led to Emil's award from our Outdoors Foundation. Ever since Emil was chartering, he made it known to legislators, and Bob Garner well, was a part of this for many years. He let Bob know that if ever a legislator wants to find out what Great Lakes fishing is all about, he says, send him on my boat. I will make time. Emil has done this for over 20 years. Uh, and still does. Anytime a legislator or even a DNR 
biologist or somebody from management wants to go, no cost, Amos hosts them on the trip. Just for the good, and it's done an awful lot of good for all of us sportsmen in the state. So we thought we'd give an award called the Sportsman Service Award to Captain Amel Dean for promoting fishing by unselfishly making Great Lakes trips available to legislators. This is something we want to promote as a part of the Outdoors Foundation, and we just happen to have a fellow on the board who is cut from that cloth in the most magnificent way. So this goes to Captain Amel Dean. If you will please give him a round of applause. In his 20 plus years of chartering, Emil has seen a lot of changes. The most dramatic was the increase in charter boats when Great Lakes salmon were on the upswing. The second most dramatic has got to be the current situation. Salmon are in shorter supply. There's a glut of charter boats, too many for even experienced captains to find enough year-round demand. And many charter boats are coming up for sale. Emil is trying to face this crunch creatively, and today is a test trip. Captain Emil got an idea. Why wouldn't his riverboat, the jet-powered James R. with a heated cabin, work for the shallow water brown trout fishing along the Lake Michigan shoreline? Lots of small boats do it, and if Emil could use his riverboat, he could offer a different kind of fishing for his customers in the spring. With the decline in charter trips in the Great Lakes, survival isn't easy for many captains, including Emil. This close to shore brown trout fishing over the sandbars and with the wind is best suited to small boats, not the big ones like his 30 foot salmon boat. So Emil installed an automatic pilot on the James R. Now he can set his course along the shoreline, the autopilot steers and Emil can work the lines in the back. Our fishing lines are running 150 yards behind the boat, some on planer boards off to the side, and Emil is a one-man crew. Here he sets up the radio antenna so he can talk to other boats. He's also installing a Loran C so he can pinpoint exact fishing spots electronically. All set? All set. All we need now is fish. All right. What, are we fishing uh, what, a certain distance from shore or a certain depth or what? Yeah, we got like three sandbars here. And usually those fish will be laying between one of the three sandbars in that trough. But they're probably moving up and down looking for smelt? Looking for smelt, yeah, mainly that's what they're after. So that's all, all the baits that we run now are all of these uh, body baits that look like, imitate the smelt. Right, yeah, they're all shallow runners. And sharp hooks. Yes, definitely sharp hooks. Oh. Wow, yeah, there isn't a lot of tension on the lines. You know, looking at the rod tips, uh, these don't create a lot of drag in the water at this speed. Well, of course, you got to remember your, your tension is actually on your other line out there because you're in an oh, alligator right. clip. Yeah. So we're going to have to grab these rods pretty fast. Yeah, we're going to be right on them. See, you know, we're bumping bottom now. See them? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's okay, though. Right. The, the browns will sometimes be in that real shallow. Right, yeah. What we'll do, we'll just run in a little zigzag pattern here until we find them, and then, then we'll zero in on them. So far, Emil's plan is working well. The autopilot, the planer boards, he can hug the shore. All we need now is a fish. We got it free now. The first fish of the year in 1990. This feels pretty darn good. And what a day. Well, I was pleased to be catching a fish, and Emil was pleased because his riverboat idea worked. How's he feel, friend? It feels good to me. You know, he's not pulling like a king, you know, no, yanking it, but uh, make it some room here. It's a good steady fight. Brown trout can be tricky to catch in the spring along the shore because a boat moving over them in shallow water scares them off. That's why the long lines are run. 150 yards back, the trout have hopefully forgotten about the boat. This one had, and with the autopilot doing the steering, Emil was free to work the net. Now this fish was opening up a new line of charter trips for Emil Dean. Look at that, eh? <laughs> By nightfall, this tasty little brown trout would be on the grill at the Dean household, providing a fitting reward for Emil's never-ending efforts to improve the quality of services he brings to his customers. For folks who don't think they can fish like this because they use wheelchairs, Emil's ahead of the game on that one too. Look what he installed last winter on his riverboat trailer, a 
a specially designed hoist to lift a wheelchair onto his riverboat because the door in his heated cabin is a few inches too narrow for a regular wheelchair Emil had a chair built just for use on his boat and Emil's son Rick charters a riverboat on the weekends he installed a hoist on his boat too and by summer Emil will have a hydraulic wheelchair hoist at his dock in Manistee for wheelchair users who want to fish on the Mary E and go for salmon in Lake Michigan Emil Dean faces the 1990s with a concern about the future of chartering, but he never gives up on ways to bring the joys of fishing to more and more people. Does this ever smell good? Mm, good transition, <laughs> Kath. Pheasant proper kosh. You know, this was a winner in our 1989 Fish and Wild Game Cooking Contest. Oh, really? Oh, and I can those, see why. Those breasts of pheasant laid right. in the margarine there. Just wow. going to brown them in the margarine and then add your onions and celery oh. and then some red wine and then some water because you do want it to be completely covered, the pieces. Well, so you're going to simmer the, these right. pieces yep. of uh, pheasant? Yep. And like I say, you want it to the water and wine to cover it. Then I'm going to add some sweet basil hmm. and then some Hungarian paprika. And it, this really does have a different taste than and flavor than just the regular paprika. And I don't know why it comes in such big containers because it doesn't last long on the shelf. I swear I can smell that right now. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Then I'm going to let that cook for 45 minutes and then you're going to turn it and cook it on the other side for 45 minutes. Oh, look at those pieces. <laughs> And then the sauce will thicken down, and but then you're going to add sour cream and a little bit of cornstarch to hmm. thicken it just a little bit more. Well, a somewhat rich recipe, but oh, that gravy. <laughs> it's worth oh, it. I, I hope you have some mashed potatoes <laughs> cooking up with this. Oh, does this just look outstanding? And that, that to thicken it, the cornstarch? Mm -hmm. Yep, just hmm. thicken it a little bit there. Pheasant paprikash. Well, Dennis won uh, first place in our... Fish and Wild Game mm -hmm. Cooking Contest Small Game Division with this, and Bob Garner, of course, loved it. <laughs> oh. This is perfection. I mean, absolute perfection. The sauce on this pheasant fe fe is A number one anyway. The sauce on it is great. And on a bed of noodles instead of rice, God bless whoever made that decision. <laughs> you did good, Kat. Here, try some of this white meat. Because you have, I know you have a leg there. Yeah, I'll take some more, too. I bet you would. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, this white meat is just terrific. Try it that, really Kat. really taste the pheasant. It does. I was surprised. That's right. This doesn't, uh, you know, boil different flavors or spices no. into the meat. Mm -mm. It sure doesn't. Oh, Excuse man, me is... for talking with my mouth full. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have it any other way right now. <laughs> but this this is moist pheasant. And if there's mm -hmm. one bugaboo about pheasant, is it's, it's dry. I mean, you might as well eat popcorn for all the moisture there. 